so I was backstage for that last talk, but did I end up coming on stage like after the guy who cured cancer? <laughs> um, that seems a little rigged. Uh, <laughs> See if I can keep up. So I don't know if I have slides this work. OK, so my name is Pablos. I work at the Intellectual Ventures Lab. Whoa, back. This is my lab. We basically bought one of every tool in the world, hired one of every kind of scientist. And what we try to do is invent for some of the bigger problems that humans have, right? This is really important. I'm only here to tell you not to make more fart apps for the iPhone. The world is trying this grand experiment every day of your life, right? We are living in it. The experiment is, can we keep more people alive every single day on just one planet, right? Every day, more people, no more additional planets. That's a big deal. The things that we did before, when we were talking about the theme here, tradition, our traditions, as much as we need to honor them, aren't going to solve the problems that we have. We have to invent. So um, what you should all do is try to find some big problems to work on. And I'm going to show you some of the ones we work on. This is a way of visualizing one of the problems that we have. We started figuring, hey, we should take on energy, because people need more. So this is a concept someone else came up with called a cubic mile of oil, which is just a way of visualizing how much energy the world uses. So in the year 2000, the planet consumed about one cubic mile of oil. That's a lot. Uh, you can see it fills 13,000 ships full of oil. Uh, today, we use three and a half cubic miles of oil every year. Right? That's a lot. A lot, a lot of oil. In the next 20 years, we need to be able to grow from three and a half an additional 1.8 cubic miles of oil every year to power the planet. And that's just the oil, not counting other stuff, right? And this is, this is if we stick with our current policies globally. So if we stick with the current policies, uh, making things more efficient, it's only 1.8 cubic miles of additional oil. If we do a really stellar job and improve on that, we only need an additional 1.4 cubic miles, right? Feeling hopeless yet? I hope so. Gas is going to get expensive. Oil and gas, oil is going to get expensive. We're going to have to, you know, start using a little less of it over that time between now and what we, we say, like 2050. So we have to come up with alternatives to replace four or five of those cubic miles with other stuff just because there's not enough oil. So visualizing the problem is a way to help you get started. So we thought we should work on alternative energies all kinds of ways besides oil to power stuff. And you know, there's a lot of cool things. Windmills are a good one. Windmills, for example, can replace one cubic mile of oil if we take our largest windmills and we cover the entire middle of the United States. <laughs> that gets you one. And that, you know, those are flyover states, so maybe no one's going to mind. <laughs> <laughs> but what happens after we put all the windmills up that we can right there? Well, you don't want them here. I mean, come on, no. Yeah, so uh, what are we going to do? Well, anyway, um, I'll leave that to you. We figured, OK, well, windmills aren't high energy density. So this is a good one. Uranium has 1.8 million times the energy density of oil. Like, that can is equivalent to, like, you know, a couple of tankers, or actually a, a lot of tankers, right? So we started looking at nuclear, which historically, you know, in our lifetime has been politically unpopular. Uh, there have been a few safety issues now and then. Um, so we want to kind of revisit uh, nuclear. It's got some problems. So what we do today is we dig up uranium out of the ground. We enrich it in these centrifuges, which basically is because that uranium has been sitting around for billions of years, and it's not as energy rich as it was. So we have to uh, enrich it in centrifuges. And then what happens is we take the enriched stuff, we put it in our reactors or our bombs, and the rest of it we put in stockpiles. We put it in these stainless steel casks. That's nuclear waste. And we stick it in stockpiles on the surface of the earth like this. And we just store it from now until kingdom come, right? 
just save that stuff in case we need it. Well, we don't know what to do with it, but um, that's nuclear waste. So a conventional reactor, today's reactors, literally burn 0.7% of the energy that's in that uranium when we dig it up, right? They're not very efficient. We don't care, because like I said, it's 1.8 million times the energy density of oil. So um, we think of that as a kind of problem. A lot of energy there that's not being used. So we design a new type of nuclear reactor. A nuclear reactor powered by nuclear waste. So in our reactor, what we do is we take that fuel that's left over and or, you know, all, the, all the waste from the stockpile, we put it in our reactor. This is neutron bombardment. You can ignore this if you want. Um, but what's happening is we take that fuel, well, take that waste, put it in our reactor, and we enrich it inside the reactor, and we burn it inside the reactor. So in this design, it's kind of like a cigar. You light it up at one end, and it burns from one end to the other over in this design over 60 years. So that leading wave enriches fuel. The second wave burns the fuel. There's no moving parts. There's not a possibility of, of uh, having a critical mass of fissionable material that can get out of control and melt down, right? So we can go back and design these things with knowledge that we didn't have when we did it the first time 50 years ago. Our entire team working on that is like old guys that we pulled out of retirement. They were like interns on the first generation of reactors. Or it's young guys who just got out of college and say, hey, nuclear might be cool. You know, there's no one in the middle because we haven't been working on that. Well, we probably should. So in our reactor, what's happening is we burn all that fuel. And we get a lot more efficiency back. This is a stockpile in Kentucky, 700, geez, what did I say? 700,000 metric tons of depleted uranium sitting on the surface of the Earth. In our reactors, we can power the entire planet, including growth, for hundreds of years using just the fuel that we have sitting there. We need new ideas like this. I hope you guys come up with some better ones than we did. Remember these guys? We're the 99%. We're not getting our fair share. Even though the you know, Blackberries and SLRs, this is basically us, right? Uh, <laughs> 99%. Now, you guys have college education. You're probably closer to the 1%. But ignoring that, doesn't matter. You're in the top 14% globally if you're at the bottom in America, right? So I don't want to hear you complaining that you're in the 99%. You're in the top 14% globally. So we should be inventing for the problems the world has. Right? We're really good at inventing for that tiny little red spot on the top. Give me a faster iPhone, damn it. You know. <laughs> Thanks, Qualcomm. Uh, they're working on it. Um, I, I love this building. I love Qualcomm as a company built for invention. If you go out in this lobby, it's one of my favorite places in the world. There's thousands of patents. The first page of every patent this company has on the wall. You should check it out. I love that. Anyway. So we're trying to take on some of these types of problems. This woman is loading vaccines into a styrofoam cooler to truck them across the Sahara to inject kids with vaccines against uh, you know, polio and things that, that kids are dying from in Africa. Right? What happens is a lot of the vaccines fail. At least 20% of them fail before they get used. They get used anyway, because we don't have a way of knowing that they failed. They failed because they didn't stay cold. Hundreds of thousands of deaths every year because of this problem. The way vaccines work, 20% is almost equivalent to zero. You've got to get pretty close to 100 before you're vaccinating the population. So we invented a new type of kind of super thermos. This thing, you stick vaccines in it, stick it in the sunshine, in the Sahara, with no external power, come back six months later, and your vaccines will still be cold. Styrofoam cooler is good for like four hours, right? So we've been deploying these things in Senegal just to test them, and they last for months, even with vaccine withdrawals every day. So you could literally load this thing up at the factory, put it on a barge, send it to Africa, drive it across the country, stick it in the bush, and start vaccinating kids, and never have to worry about the power going out or worry about whether things are going cold or, whether, or they're not staying cold. 
Um, another invention area we worked on, a little close to home for Qualcomm. I might get kicked out for showing this. <laughs> this is an antenna. You may know it as a pipe organ, but those are resonators, and each one resonates in a different frequency, right? That's what's going on. But that's kind of an analog, old school antenna. We replace pipe organs with these things. Synthesizers don't have pipes anymore. They don't have a resonator for every frequency. They synthesize it using a computer chip, right? We synthesize every song you listen to now comes off of a tool like this, right? It's artificially manufactured by computers and it's better. <laughs> so those domes you see on boats contain a steerable satellite dish so that we can talk to a geostationary satellite up there to get internet to boats, right? This is the Predator drone. The reason it has that bullfrog shape is because there's a physically steerable dish in there so that it can talk to satellites so kids in Nevada can control it with a joystick, <laughs> or whatever, right? So that's because to talk to the satellites, you gotta aim your antenna. We don't actually have any other idea how we're gonna aim an antenna at a satellite. So it's mechanically gimbaled, it's big and heavy and expensive. A few years back, we started working on a new area in science called metamaterials. These are materials that don't exist in nature, but sometimes you can make them and they can do really cool stuff. In this case, we made a tunable dielectric. So we made an antenna using metamaterials. This is a flat panel, but it can electronically steer its beam with no moving parts. We can stick that on the roof of a car or a boat or a plane and it can track satellites. You know, the new satellite networks, the new satellites that are going up today, every one of them has more capacity than the entire network from yesterday, right? We have a huge amount of internet, wireless internet capacity in the new satellite networks. No way to talk to them without putting a big dish on the ground and steering it. This thing, you duct tape it to the roof, it finds a satellite and tracks it, so we can use LEO satellites. Geostationary satellites are like 400 milliseconds away really slow, you don't even want to use those things. LEO satellites are only 25 milliseconds away, but they're whizzing by. Anyway, we can get gigabit wireless to everyone on the planet this way. That's a really important thing to do. I personally believe, and again, you get to kick me out after this, get people on the internet, they can solve their own problems, <laughs> right? Um, this, yeah. All right, uh, this is what it'll look like. So uh, the last thing I want to talk about I don't know, uh, I'm sure you guys have all seen 3D printers and they're the future and stuff. I've been working on advancing 3D printers, so I work on this one called MakerBot, but I also work on new 3D printing technologies. So I'm gonna tell you about uh, what I've been working on. Um, in every business in the world, we have used computers to collect data, to analyze the data, and make better decisions, right? We don't have any data about anything you ever ate in your entire life. In the 80s, I would say, someday you'll have a computer in your car. People thought I was crazy, and I probably was. But now you have 70 computers in your car, all right? Someday you'll have a computer in your phone. Now we obviously take that for granted. Now I'm saying someday computers will make your food, and I think that is really important. So imagine a machine like that with three buttons on it. What I ate yesterday, what my friends like, and I'm feeling lucky. And you push one of those buttons, and I've got toner cartridges of frozen or dried and powdered food. A print head puts down a pixel of food, hydrate it with a needle, zap it with a laser to cook it, rinse and repeat for every pixel, and I print you a meal. All right? But it's a meal customized for you. And it avoids your allergens and dietary restrictions, maybe injects your pharmaceuticals. <laughs> um, and that's really powerful thing, we can correlate your diet to the health effects, apply Photoshop filters to your diet, say you gotta get off sodium, you know, well, drop it by a couple milligrams a day, you'll never feel it happening, right? We can't do those things today, right? The way you're eating right now is like cavemen. That looks good, <laughs> eat it. <laughs> um, it won't stay that way, and it shouldn't stay that way. But the more important reason to do that is the way Americans eat right now is wildly inefficient. 
you guys throw out about 40% of the food before you ever even eat it. That's what's going on in America. Every American grocery store throws out 2,000 pounds a week in expired food, right, before anyone buys it. So in a system like this, I've got you know, shelf stable, all the, all the nutrients, all the flavor, and a toner cartridge. It stays there for years, and I don't print any more food than you're going to eat. I generate no local waste. It's a way to start getting some efficiencies back. That's important because when you look at our global trends again, we've got population growth. Obviously, got to feed you know 50% more people over the rest of our lifetime. But right now, what's happening is you eat like Americans because you're Americans. The rest of the world eats the same thing every day, and they want to eat like Americans, right? They want more meat and more variety in their diet, and that's exactly what they spend it on if they get an extra dollar. Before they buy an iPod, they add more meat and more variety to their diet. You compound that with population growth. We don't actually have a plan for how to feed everybody. And so we need to find ways to make it more efficient. We've done that in every other industry with computers, and so um, I'm suggesting that you guys get on this, start making robots to make me some food. <laughs> um, all right, that's all I had for you today. I'm going to get off stage. Thanks so much. I will be hanging out all day, and I hope that you find time to come hang out with me and tell me why I'm wrong. So.